stages in our spiritual development. Some of us, you, some of us, arms right up the back to get here this morning, and actually, you're not even sure there's a God, and you don't know what's going on. And the last three quarters of an hour has been a real mystery to you, and I completely understand that, and that's absolutely fine. Other people very comfortable with church, know exactly what they believe, and uh, very far on on this whole thing, and and they just know uh, that they want to live all of their life, and that's financial life as well, under uh, the Lordship of Jesus, because actually we found that he knows best. So that's true. That was difficult last week when we talked about time, but at least all of us have the same amount of time. But it's doubly difficult this week, because not only is there that difference between us, but we also all have different amounts of money. And I'm very conscious when I speak this morning that, that some of us, if we sold our houses and sold up everything we've got, that we'd, we'd probably be multimillionaires. I mean, there's one or two people, probably more than that, in this room that would be the situation for. There's also people in this room who fairly recently had to make a phone call to the Christians Against Poverty guys and say, I'm in so much trouble. Can I have a meeting with you because I need to sort out my finances because I'm in debt and I'm not coping. And the fact that I know that there's two or three people in the room who've done that recently also makes me think that there's probably another four or five people in the room who haven't done that and probably ought to do that. So I'm aware this morning that we're talking to a whole range of people, but I'll just tell you where I'm coming from. If this helps, I, I, I don't know if it does. But for a lot of years, I've tried to follow Jesus. For a lot of years, I've tried to take the Bible seriously and apply it to my life. And I've found that it works. And partly as a result of that, and partly because I'm an accountant, money's been all right for me. And actually the way that we've tried to honor God with our money means that I believe we've been blessed beyond what I've ever earned. I don't understand it. I just see it happen. And and I'm just so glad about that. And uh, But that does mean that I'm not worried about what I'm going to eat tomorrow, where I'm going to sleep tonight, or what clothes I can afford next year. Uh, So you need to hear that. But I know that for some of you, that's not true. That you are worried about what you're going to eat tomorrow what you're going to wear next year, and whether you'll have enough money to get the car through the MOT. And so, hear me, I, you just need to know where I'm coming from. So, I've also come from a place where I've tried to live this out for a lot of years. So, since I was 17, I had a car accident, and it wrote off all my savings. I say a car accident, I was on a push bike at the time, it was the car that was damaged. And that wiped out all my savings, and I realized that that was the money I should have given to God over the last year that I hadn't done, which was a bit of a revelation to me. So I started to just give regularly. And so ever since then, I've given to the church, to God, and and God has blessed that. And that's not to say that nothing bad ever happens. It does financially and in other ways too, but it does mean that God gives back somehow. And so that's why I'm in the situation I'm in. Anyway, so we're talking this morning about time and money. And I'm also conscious that one of the things that happens when we talk about money in church is that Jesus was right uh, when he said that, whoops, go back one, uh, that you cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and mammon. And when Jesus named this thing mammon, money mammon, he, he gives it an identity as a spiritual power. And that Jesus was right when he talked about money as a spiritual power because it has and wants to have power over us. And so two things happen. One is that we can live under the power of money, and that's a really bad place to live, uh, however much or little we've got. And the other thing that happens is whenever you talk about it, there's this heaviness that descends on the room, which is rather unfortunate because there's a spiritual stuff going on here uh, as well as uh, just the physical stuff. So if you could just laugh out loud for a long time now, that would really help. (laughs) Thank you very much. That just sort of lightens the mood a bit and stops it getting really heavy uh, because because actually Jesus was quite heavy about this and in the Sermon on the Mount which is this big one where he sat on a horse and preached no he didn't when he went up a mountain and preached and he talks about money being a spiritual power and uh, and that's important 
Uh, what you normally do with spiritual powers, in the Bible anyway, is cut them down, chop them up, burn them, and have nothing to do with them. And, and that's okay, except we can't do that with money, because we have to have money all the time. It's like the difference between having an alcohol problem and an eating disorder. If you have an alcohol problem, you can stop drinking alcohol. It might be really hard, you might need a lot of support and a lot of prayer, but you can stop it, you can get rid of it, it can have nothing to do with you anymore. And, and you can try and live like that. And you can, but you can't do that with an eating disorder, because you have to eat. Similarly with money, even though Jesus identifies it as a spiritual power, he, we still have to use it. We start, and we have to use it in a way so that it's not using us. We have to allow Jesus to be Lord over it so that it's not Lord over us. Does that make some sense? Because it's very easy to allow money to be Lord over us. And so I've been thinking about this quite a lot over the years. And one of the ways that... and. Uh, I, one of the ways that money tries to be lord over us is controlling our desires. Money wants us to want it. Money wants us to want things. And to put that above everything else. And we know that no one on their deathbed ever says, I wish I went to work more. But often we live like that because we want to earn the money. Often we live like that because because we want to. Oh, am I on film? <laughs> that that's because I'm also on film from there. That's getting streamed live, and and I never think about you guys getting streamed live. Or is it at the back there? It's at the back there. Hello. I never think about those guys, but suddenly seeing a camera there, that's frightening. Okay, I'll have to try and be careful what I say. Where were we? Um, <laughs> yeah, desire. One of the things that money wants to do is to lord it over us, the power of desire, more money, more stuff. And the Bible calls that greed. And we're familiar with that, aren't we? We're familiar with that in other people. And we can be familiar with that sometimes in ourselves. And the Bible's quite clear. It talks about the opposite of greed, which is contentment. And it says godliness with contentment is a great gain. We brought nothing into the world. We can take nothing out of it. I've done a few funerals. That's true. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Well, probably only if we have some level of spiritual godliness. If we're aware spiritually what's going on, if we're trying to live for Jesus, then godliness and contentment, we might be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap. This is where he's starting to talk about greed here. He's talking about a temptation, a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And then the famous line, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the truth, pierced themselves with many griefs. And then a bit later on in verse 17, uh, Paul says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. That's a good line, isn't it? God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Come on to that in a minute. So this whole thing, oh yeah, <laughs> this is the just the caricature, isn't it? Um, we're familiar with the idea of the films of the poor little rich girl, either this one or a subsequent one probably, and uh, familiar with the idea of the miser and, and the whole greed thing that that just does us in spiritually. And it's a caricature, but it's a caricature of the truth, which is why Paul talks about contentment. And somehow, if we can reach that point where greed is not dominating us, we break the power of desire that money wants to put on us as it tries to make us worship it so it tries to make us obey it the cheese on the desire trap is a hunt for oh, another picture of money there is a hunt for security the reason very often we're motivated by greed motivated by desire is because of the security that it brings. And, and security is, is a valuable thing, isn't it? Being financially insecure is really difficult. It's a horrible place to be. But, but the desire to accumulate more and more stuff, more and more money, that desire is, I believe, motivated by 
by an inner lack of security. And we can find that in Jesus. We really can. To know, as Joan said this morning, that we're loved from heaven. To know that the Father in heaven really loves us. That, that we are secure in relationship with Father God. That we're secure in, in the love of Christ. That we're secure in the knowledge of the Holy Spirit can, can stop us from pursuing stuff. It really can. Because that insecurity can drive us to try and accumulate more and more and more just for the sake of stability, security. Another thing that uh, money does is to build our security and forget God. In fact, way back in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, when uh, God was leading people through the wilderness and he was giving them manna from heaven every day and, and quail in the evening and, and they were eating just the provision of God every day, God knew that when they got into the land and settled there, that one of the dangers would be that they forgot him. And so God says, what I want you to do is in order to remind yourself that all the stuff you have comes from me, in order to remind yourself that your security isn't in the things that you've built and the, the harvest that you've reaped, but that your security is in me. What I want you to do is to put stuff on your doorposts. So every time you go through the door, you remember that this is my provision, that this house is my provision. I want you to put stuff on your arms so that you remember that everything you've worked for by the strength of your hand comes from me. I want you to put uh, something on your forehead so that you remember that everything that you've, you've got that's as a result of your brain and your intellect comes from me. And uh, I suggest that we do that. In fact, I, no, no, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> but somehow we need a way of reminding ourselves regularly that all we have comes from him, that our security is in God, not in what we own. And that when we have stuff like a house, that 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 that's a gift from heaven. That when we've got wages that we've earned through our hands, that that's a gift from God. That when we've got things in our home that have earned by the, the, the way that we've thought and used our mind and creativity in order to produce wealth, that that's come from him. And so I don't suggest we walk around with a box of the Bible on our forehead or something wrapped around our wrist or we, we put boxes on our door frames, but something like that could really help us not to forget God, to have our security in him and not allow the desire for more stuff to overrule our spiritual growth. Does that make some sense? So I know some people have put reminders on their phone. Some people have, have just every time they notice another hour has passed, they just do something to acknowledge that what they've got comes from heaven. Some people say grace before meals. Some people have a way of saying thank you to God every night before they go to bed and mean it. Maybe we'll come on to that in a minute. So um, here's a picture of the inside of my car. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that, um, if you've seen my car, you'll know, yeah. <laughs> Someone asked me if I wanted to go on the motorbike yesterday. That was good. <laughs> it was my motorbike. <laughs> anyway, um, the uh, where were we? Yeah, um, one of the things that money does to us, this whole desire thing, it's not only security, but it's self-esteem. And 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 this is tricky because if the Lord of all the earth gives us all things to enjoy. I believe God is pleased when we make a good decision to make a good purchase of a nice item that reflects his creativity and we can enjoy that as a gift from heaven. <laughs> or maybe not. But it's, it's a short step from there to getting our self-esteem from the things that we have, isn't it? Or to judge other people by what they have. And one of the ways that money wants to dominate our lives is to, to cause us to value ourselves or other people simply by the amount of money we have, the amount of possessions we have. And, and we can find ourselves doing that, can't we? The imagined comments of people, what we think people are thinking of us as we wear the new outfit, as I didn't do this morning, as we, as we drive the car, as we 
show them the photos of the holiday or point them to the latest gadget in the home or whatever it is, and we can get some self-esteem from that. And somehow we need to work out how we can enjoy stuff without it causing us to think more highly of ourselves when your self-esteem is based in who you are in Christ. That Jesus has put an infinite value on you, sufficient to die on a cross for you. That's his valuation of you, and that's his valuation of the people around you. It's not at all dependent on how much stuff you've got. Jesus loved you enough to die for you. That's the value he puts on you. That is your spiritual value. Don't let money rob you of that. Or rob you of considering other people in that way. This is a valuable person of inestimable worth who Jesus thought it worth giving his life for. Just because they're dressed a bit shabbily, because they can't afford a decent car, because they haven't got a home, doesn't denigrate their value in the sight of God. It's difficult, isn't it? How can we practically do that? Well, one of the ways we can do it is to... Oh. <laughs> I'd forgotten this bit. There is an explanation of this, this one. Because I was going to talk about arrogance for a bit, and I thought that's just such an arrogant monkey with the swagger. And uh, <laughs> just the... Because Paul talked about that, didn't he, in the reading we did earlier about about don't, don't become arrogant. Because that's another way that money warps us, isn't it? By giving us an arrogance about the things that we have. And whether it's the gold-plated Mercedes or whether... Yeah, never mind. Move on. Okay. One of the ways that we can overcome this is simply by trusting God. That doing something deliberate that forces us to trust God for some of our money. And if it's not... So, oh, it's gone. Oh, it's back again. If... Now, if, it, if it's not trusting God for some of our money, trusting God for something. So when I was a, a student, a theology, theological student, I wasn't a very good one, but I did have to trust God for my money because you didn't get grants in those days to do Bible college and the church was so small it couldn't afford to pay me and uh, to support me. And, and so what I had to do is each night I would go to bed and pray and each morning I would go to the mailbox and see if anyone had sent me any money. And it was delightful. It was such a great experience because I honestly didn't know uh, whether I'd have enough money to come home for the holidays. It was just fantastic. And all the time God provided. It was amazing. And I've some great stories from that time. The trouble is they're 45 years old now uh, about how God provided for me financially because I was trusting him. And it was, it was great. I had tax rebates. I had gifts from people I hardly knew. I had um, money that just turned up. I had no, no idea where it came from. Expenses that I thought would be massive and they ended up not being. And it was great. And I was living. Then I got a job here and they've given me a salary every month, which is really sad. No, it's not really sad. No, no. It's a really good thing. Please don't stop doing that. They give me a salary every month and it's glorious. But what it means is that the danger is that I don't trust God for my money. And so I have to find other things to trust God for, like finding great staff. Yes, God comes through for you, doesn't he, sometimes, all the time. Like trusting that people will turn up when you put on a free family fun day and you persuade loads of people to give a day of their time to make something happen. and that, Like trusting God with a couple of business ventures that we're really expecting to produce some massive fruit. Finding ways to trust in God. Now, for some of us, it's where does my next meal come from? For some of us, we need to stretch ourselves. Maybe financially, maybe emotionally, maybe spiritually. Wasn't it great to hear from Kyle? Because I don't think Carl's ever done anything like that before. So, yeah. Well done. Because it's hard to pray for someone and trust that God's going to speak through you. It's hard to pray for someone and, and trust that God's going to give you something to say. It's hard to do that, isn't it, Kyle? 
Well done. <laughs> Very good. And it is, it's putting ourselves in places, it's putting ourselves in places where we're trusting God. That's really important. And it breaks the power of money over us. Another way is by giving. You've just done that. Well done. If you gave just now, you've done something that breaks the power of desire of money over you. Another way is by giving thanks, by finding a way of thanking God for everything that we have. And that's really difficult because it took me a lot of effort to earn this money this month. It took me a lot of stress, a lot of pain, and my pay packet is the only reason I go to work. That's not true for me, but it's true for a lot of people. And it's hard then to be thankful to God for that. But if we can cultivate... Uh, a thankfulness in our heart and in our spirit that will break the power of money over us. Some of us do that by saying grace at the beginning of meals and the challenge is to make it so it's creative and different and not just some, God bless our food, amen. Some of us do it by doing something each evening where we look back on the day and just give thanks to God for all his provision during the day of great friendships, of good conversation of the meals that we've eaten the clothes that we've worn of the options that we've had of the things that God has done and we're just so grateful and sometimes it's just flat and other times we can really thank God and developing that attitude of thanksgiving helps break the power of the desire of money over us another way of breaking the power of money over us is to see the spiritual riches that we have you know, the first song we sang, I, sorry, I'm not, not convinced by that song, to be honest. I don't know if anyone else can remember it, but there's a really good line in it where it says, deep cries out to deep. And uh, there's something deep in you that cries out to something that's deep in God and hidden in him. And there's a connection. Sometimes it's not between you and God. Sometimes it's between you and another person, deep in you, calling out to the deep in someone else. And, and that's really valuable. Then there's a whole load of other spiritual riches, things like knowing that we're loved from Father God. Things like knowing the peace of Christ in our mind and in our heart. Knowing that we're forgiven. Knowing the joy that comes from heaven, even in the most horrible of circumstances. Knowing that we're right with God. Knowing that we have an eternal future with him. These are spiritual riches. And, and if you're into looking at the Bible, if you're into doing Bible studies, I would just encourage you, get a, go on to Bible Gateway. And just do a search for riches and see what comes up. Because most of the riches that we have are spiritual. And as we acknowledge that and realize that, then as followers of Jesus, that breaks the power of money over our lives. And stops us wanting more and more and more and more. Does that make sense? Okay, that's point one. Point two and three are much quicker, I promise. So point one was the way that money tries to dominate our lives is by stimulating desire. The second is the way that money tries to dominate our lives is by pushing us into, oh, that's desire, I've done that one, into debt. Into debt. That debt is just a powerful prison that allows money to dominate our lives been a couple of times in my life when I've had less than 10, 10 pound in the world and no assets and and I've been on the precipice of that debt trap and I know that if that was happening today and not 40 years ago it would be so much easier to have fallen into that because it's so much because our society I think has sown to the wind and reaped a whirlwind when it comes to debt And the Bible simply says that the, the borrower is a servant to the lender. And there is a debt trap. And, and I would just encourage you that if you're in it, to get out of it. That you find a way somehow of paying off the debts. If you're juggling credit cards, then you know, I can juggle with three balls for a little while. 
but I will drop one, which is why I didn't do it this morning, because it would illustrate that very well. <laughs> but if it's four balls or five balls, or seven, and I defy anyone to try and juggle with seven or eight or nine for more than 24 hours, Work a plan to get out of debt. If, if it's manageable debt, then manage it so you get out of it. If it's unmanageable debt, talk to CAP, Christians Against Poverty. Google them, phone the number. You'll get put through to the head office. They'll direct you to Colchester. A couple of the people who work at the Colchester Debt Center will come to this church. They're here today, and they will help you get out of debt because debt tries to dominate us. It's one of the ways... Money dominates our lives. That was the second point. Told you it would be quicker. Desire, debt, and the third way is decisions. That money, like any false god, any spiritual power, wants to make the decisions about how we live for us. And those of us who've said, Lord Jesus, I want you to make the decisions in my life because I realize you know better than I do what's good for me, then, then we've made that decision. But occasionally we capitulate to money and allow that to make the decisions in our lives. Money as a spiritual power wants to do that in us and for us to make the decisions. Every day we have all sorts of opportunities and most of them cost money. Don't they? Many of us this week will have to make a decision about whether to go for a coffee, to renew the gym membership, watch a film, give to the church, enjoy a special meal, buy a shirt, or book a holiday. And most of us will make some of those decisions in the next week or two. And mammon, money, wants to be at the top of the decision-making process. Money wants to decide for you which of those you will do. It wants to be on the top of the list of priorities. It wants to make the decision for us. It wants us to say, I can't afford it. Before we've thought about anything else, before we've thought about our health, before we've thought about our relationships, before we've thought about our spirit, before we've thought about our spirituality, before we've thought about the kingdom of God, before we've thought about our well-being, before we've thought about our pleasure or the pleasure it will give to anyone else, it wants us to say, I can't afford it. It wants to make the decisions. And we can tell if we've fallen into that trap simply by listening to ourselves and seeing how many times we say, I can't afford it. Because if we're saying that all the time, then money's making the decisions. I told you it got heavy when we talked about money. <laughs> you feel that? That's sort of... Hmm. So if you could just laugh out loud for 30 seconds, that would really help. <laughs> How can we dethrone money from being at the top of the decision-making process. Because if we don't, there's a few things that happen. One is that we, our values get warped. And um, I've got a star here to tell me to click onto the next picture. And I can't remember what the next picture is, which is a bit of a problem, because if I do it and it's a mistake, yeah, that'll do. Um, sometimes our values get warped, and we start to think that if it's bigger or better or more expensive or more luxurious or more ostentatious than it must be true. If money's at the top of our priorities, then, then that, if it's more expensive, it must be better, it becomes one of our values, and that's really not helpful. Another thing that, another way our values get warped is, is, is by living up to our station. How many of us have had a big promotion, and three or four years later, we, we're living at the same level? We don't understand it. We're earning so much more money, but we don't have, we're still in the same debt. We're still struggling at the end of the month, even though we earn so much more than we did three or five years ago. Because we've just let money decide. How can we stop money making the decisions? Well, this is hard, but it, it works. We have to, I believe, 
have a buffer. We have to save a bit so that we've got a buffer, so that we can do stuff, so that money doesn't have to be the final decision. Now, this, for some of us, we've never thought about this before. And actually, we can just step into this tomorrow. For others of us, this is going to take a while to do. We need a way of finding, of finding a way of saving a fiver a week so that we can have, by the end of the year, 250 quid in our bank account that will mean that we don't have to make money the deciding factor on all our decisions. So when someone asks us for a coffee, money doesn't enter into our head. Do I want to spend two hours with this person? <laughs> And a whole load of other questions come into our mind about our health, about our spirit, about the pleasure that we give ourselves or with them. Different decisions about our well-being, our spirituality, the kingdom of God, the opportunity that that provides. Or if someone says, can we go on holiday? Then money doesn't have to, if we've got 250 quid in the bank, then the money isn't the deciding factor. Another way we can do it, another way we can do it, is, and as I say, I'm conscious that for some people that, that is really difficult, but I would encourage you, make it a plan. If I asked you to give up an evening a week from now until whenever, you'd find it really difficult. If I said try and do it from September, you could. Because you can organize it, plan it, and work it out. If you're going to get out of debt, if you're going to get a little bit of a buffer, that buffer might for some people be a tenner. It might for some people be ten times that. For some people it might be even more than that. But get to a place where money isn't making the decisions. If you didn't watch TV for a year, that's 130 quid. Although that does contradict the next one, which is develop simple pleasures. And some, some of you are really good at this, and it's great to see and, and, and well done. But just try and develop, in order to stop making money the ultimate arbiter of what we do, create a list of things that you do that are just very cheap or free. You know, things like walking or cycling. Things like going to the beach or the woods, walking around antique shops without looking at the labels to find out how much stuff costs. <laughs> Doing stuff that, you know, a long coffee with a good friend that opens your, your Jahari window and helps you to be open with other people. Finding a prayer partner, listening to an album, reading a book, having a long bath. All of those things help us to break the power of money to make the decision over what we do and how we do it. So money tries to dominate us by the way that it pushes us to desire. And Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. There's far more important things in life than how much stuff we've got. Money tries to dominate us by pushing us into debt. And there's help here and a determination, get out of debt because it is a trap, a prison. And if you're in it and you haven't told anyone about it, make that call in confidence. You say, I don't want to talk to anyone in Colchester because those people in that church know who I am. Then say, I want to go to the Chelmsford Debt uh, Cap Centre and they'll do it there. But find a way of getting out of debt. And don't let money make the decisions. Of course it's a factor. You can only spend it once. But don't put it at the top of the tree. A couple of other things before um, I finish, because uh, I haven't spoken for long enough yet. <laughs> Sorry, this has gone on a long time, hasn't it? Um, it all belongs to God. It's all his. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know that. 
Find a way of being accountable for what you earn, for what you have. If it all belongs to God, God actually it only makes sense. Life only makes sense if we're accountable for it. That was what the writer of Ecclesiastes said. And uh, stewardship of our money is really important. So find a way of working out where it all goes. Uh, just a challenge for you. If you um, take a piece of paper when you get home, write down how much you earn, and then work out where it all went last month. And see if you can work out in two minutes where your money went. Now, it depends who you're, you know, who you're living with and all the rest as to whether you need to do that as a couple or whether you need to do it, whatever. And some people will be able to do that really easily. Good on you. But some people, there'll be a huge percentage of money that you can't account for. And you want, where's that? Well, actually, you're accountable for that to God if you're a follower of Jesus. Find a way of stewarding well. And thirdly, giving. Giving. I said thirdly a few times, I'm not, it's a preacher's trick. <laughs> so we had three desire, debt, decisions, and then three things at the end. All belongs to God. You're accountable for it. And lastly, give. Give. Be generous because it breaks the power of money. It says I'm not going to be controlled by the desire for money. It says I'm trusting God for my needs to make up for what I'm just giving here. It says I'm recognizing that everything I have comes from God and saying I'm sowing a seed that I'm expecting to produce a fruit and harvest. When we give, we recognize that God loves a cheerful giver. When we give, it says that we claim the promise that God rewards a secret giver. When we give, we're investing in eternity. We can't take it with us, but we can send it on ahead. When we give, it's part of my worship. When I give, I'm breaking the power of money serving my heavenly father we're going to pray one of the ways that we do this at the end of our services here not all every week but quite often is we get into little groups of two three four people and talk and pray together and i'd encourage you to be part of this because this is just so helpful I had a lady last week who um, for the first time stayed in in the little prayer circles and it was great great and, and I would just encourage you to do that. Balaji is going to lead us. Where is she? Um, Balaji is going to lead us uh, just to pray together about these things very briefly to finish our service. Thank you, Balaji.